Holy Spirit will not forgive me. As many of you may or may not know about me, I love making intellectual connections. I love seeing how one idea affects another. More than that, I love it when other people make these connections as well. I'm often asked by my students, what do I want them to accomplish in my courses where we discuss these big ideas? My answer is that I want them to make these connections. I want them to see how an idea can resonate with them and help them make better decisions, resolve some conflict, or urge them to look at things from a different point of view. Today, many of us think of an idea as just a fleeting thought, a whim, or at best some sort of thought experiment. Ideas are much more than someone's opinion, though. Ideas are expressions of fundamental concepts. I love ideas. Ideas are powerful. Once a connection is made with an idea, it can move us to approach everything in a new light. They tell us that something is valuable, something else is not. Ideas shape how we approach the problems and people in our lives. New ideas come into the world and change it. Key to the discussion of the Fourth Ecumenical Council is the idea advanced much earlier by Gregory the Theologian, that what has not been assumed cannot be restored. It is what is united with God that is saved. This idea may not seem so earth-shattering, but if we make a connection with it like the fathers of the Fourth Ecumenical Council did, we can see how this is not simply one man's opinion, but a central concept that we must connect with for our own salvation. That what we want saved must be united with Christ. Of course, the history of ideas include a lot of bad ideas, too. Lots of things that people should run away from. St. Justinian the Great, when calling the Fifth Ecumenical Council, believed that there, where there was false doctrine, there would be false worship. Where bad ideas are given prominence, our attention moves away from Christ. Paul, in his pastoral epistle to Titus today, addresses those who believed in God and tells them to avoid some of these bad ideas that result in false worship. Paul lists stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels over the law. The focus of this list is not how we engage with ideas of the world. Paul is not writing about how the president is incompetent, or the size and function of government, or how Disney is ruining all of our beloved movies with all their cash grab remakes. Rather, Paul is writing to Titus to tell the Christians under his watch to focus instead on things which are profitable for our lives in Christ. How many times do we run into stupid controversies? The world is full of them. And while they might seem vitally important today, we usually look back upon them as a waste of our time and our effort. The same applies to genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels over the law. St. Paul tells us that these are all bad because these are unprofitable and futile. It is not just that they are a waste of time, but they cause us to become perverted and sinful. If we focus on these, our attention is taken away from our spiritual life in the church. They pervert us because our focus is turned inwards. We look only at ourselves as the arbiter of truth, instead of Christ, who is the truth. This is a poisonous idea that took root in the Enlightenment, and many of us by default hold it today. The result of entertaining this idea is that we become self-condemned through the false worship of ourselves. When we become the sole authority, we advance contentions and divisions. St. John Chrysostom reminds us that when St. Paul tells us to have nothing more to do with those who sow contentions or dissensions, the apostle means with heretics. For when a man is perverted and predetermined not to change his mind, whatever may happen, why should you labor in vain, Chrysostom states, showing upon a rock when you should spend your honorable toil upon your own people? When we are committed to our own factious opinions, then we become heretics. A great number of the fathers, including Dionysius, Athanasius, Basil the Great, all echo Chrysostom's interpretation of Paul's epistle to Titus. Their conclusion is that those who love their opinion more than their brothers are heretics. St. Ambrose, when discussing the passage, states, one who is a heretic, avoid after the first reproof, knowing that such a one is fallen and is in sin. Today, we often think of a heretic as someone who believes the wrong thing. But the origin of the term and the proper understanding of a heretic is not someone who is simply wrong, someone who cares more about their own estimation uh, and the judgment than that of the church. The sinful idea has taken root that they are more important than the body of Christ. St. Maximus of Turin, writing in the 5th century, states, 
the heretic departs himself by the judgment of his own will. This is the sin of pride, the worship of self instead of God. When we reject the teaching of the church because we know better, we cut ourselves off. We make ourselves heretics every time we obstinately refuse to obey our bishop, our priest, every time we reject our brother or sister in the church instead of loving them as Christ commands us to do. Or as St. Paul said in the epistle, we engage in stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, or quarrels over the law. The solution is humility. The idea that needs to take root in us is that our lives are not our own. We live not for ourselves, but for Christ. We are stewards, not owners of ourselves and our talents. A steward is judged based upon how faithful they have been with what has been given to them. Paul, therefore, urges us to be faithful to apply ourselves to good deeds. This included a practical act of loving their brothers, Zenos the lawyer, yes, a lawyer, and Apollos. They should be urged on lacking in nothing, he says. This is the expression of love for Christ. This is the idea that St. Gregory tells us that what is united with God is that which is saved. It is when we love our brothers and care for them that we are the light of the world, as Christ mentions in the Gospel reading today. We are called not just to avoid the sins of stupid controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels over the law, but we are called to shine before men. Our love for one another should be so noticeable that men may see our good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. The light is not our own, nor is it for us alone. Many of us come to the church and we take a candle from the narthex, we then stand in front of an icon of Christ with the Theotokos, say a prayer, we light a candle. We don't take the candle back with us. Instead, we place it on the stands in the front of the church. Our prayer, our entreaty for mercy, life, hope, and love is not taken or hidden away, but instead it is placed in front for all to see. We may have purchased the candle, but the light is never our own. It is only through loving one another that we are faithful stewards. It is only when we see and we embrace the idea of stewardship that we can understand what Christ tells us in the second half of the gospel. Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I have come to uh, not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Christ tells us that the two greatest commandments are to love God and to love our neighbor. These are not new commandments. They come from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Christ is the only one who perfectly and completely loves God and us. This is how he fulfilled the law. He filled it to overflowing. St. Cyril, in his commentary on this verse, states that that which then was lacking here is made full. We lack this perfect love. Christ does not abolish the law because of our weakness, but he fills us with this love and the strength to shine before men. Christ is the Lord of us, also enables us to do what he has called us to do. Today we also commemorate the Fourth Ecumenical Council, Chalcedon, uh, which affirms the words of Gregory the Theologian, that what has not been assumed cannot be restored. It is what is united with God that is saved. It tells us that Christ assumed all of our humanity. He was like us in every way but sin. A synopsis of the proclamation of the Council states, that Christ is perfect according to his divinity and perfect according to his humanity. Truly God and truly man. Consubstantial with the Father according to divinity and consubstantial with us according to humanity. Completely like us except sin. Known in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. While there's a lot that can be said about this council, I want to briefly tie it in with the Epistle and Gospel lesson today to remind us how good ideas can shape us. The Council of Chalcedon confirmed that Christ is both entirely divine and entirely human. In other words, Christ is both the giver of the law and the doer of the law. Christ applies himself to the good deeds that we are called to do. And Christ both shown before God and man and is the source for us to do the same. Christ became man in the form of a servant and emptied himself without diminishing his omnipotence. He descended from his heavenly throne, but did not surrender his Father's glory. Christ models stewardship for us as well. As St. Paul states in Philippians 2.11, Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. 
Christ passes on the glory he receives to the Father. To share in Christ's life, we need to pass on what we have to Christ. We must understand that we are stewards of all that we are. We must be vigilant and discern what ideas we let take root in our lives. We can embrace the philosophy of this world and accept it, an idea, but as Proverbs tells us, there is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, the way is death. Or we can accept the idea put forward in the church, the idea that we must be united to Christ and live, uh, that we are only stewards of what has been given to us. The fundamental idea that Christianity advances in the world is transformative. We are not called just to agree with this idea, but to do it. We are called to be doers of the law. All of the law and the prophets hang on loving God and our neighbor. That is always where we should start. We should be enthusiastic about service. Know that everything that you have, including your talents and abilities, will be called upon as a steward. As St. Gregor the theologian said, it is only those things that are united with God that are saved. If you like something about yourself, if you admire a talent that you have, use it in service for Christ's church. St. Gregory the Great adds that if you refuse a position when you are called, you will forfeit the majority of your gifts. He adds gifts which you receive not for yourselves only, but for others. Only that which is united with Christ will last. Let us unite what is good about us to Christ and his church, be doers of the law, and therefore be called great. Let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers of the Fourth Ecumenical Council and St. Gregory the Theologian.